Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle. Defining Concepts in Current Media, and I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. They are also available uh, as an attachment, and as an email, if you just uh, write us. Uh, the, the email is at philosophypublishing.com website. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MA from Tufts, an MBA from Wharton. He's retired from the investment banking industry and is now a venture capitalist. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of concepts being used, being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which they are being used. This week, the concept of choice here that's been in the news quite pretty much since the election and before is same-sex marriage. And so we're going to start with the nature of marriage, how it came to be, and then we'll We'll view the question and examine the nature of uh, the nature of marriage and the question of same-sex marriage and is it good for society? Let's start. Marriage, of course, is uh, has a biological function and has come uh, to evolve in the in the human species. And it first started probably when there was environmental changes in the plains of Africa. The plains of Africa were produced out of jungles starting to dry up. From the environmental changes uh, happening then, uh, and those environmental changes produced less rainfall, plains started to develop, and a loss of, a partial loss of niches uh, for the apes and the monkeys that inhabited the trees that started to diminish, so some of the population had to move out onto the plains that were new, newly developing. Over time, these apes had to form troops. As they do now, today you can see the uh, troops of baboons on the, on the plains of Africa. They were no longer able to stand individually because they didn't have the protection of the trees, so they had to perform the protection of the troops and groups that form greater protection for them as, they, as other animals do on the plains of Africa. But something else happened. Also with environmental climate change, you get, a, you get a genetic code, pressure for genetic codes to change. And these groups that came out into the plains found that there was, a, that there was pressure, environmental pressure, environmental pressure for increased intelligence. And as apes can do today uh, with rudimentary tools, tools start to evolve with the increased intelligence being generated by the evolutionary genetic code changes. Well, what happens when you get larger intelligence or uh, 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 more intelligence? You get a larger brain. And when you get a larger brain, it changes the reproductive capacity of the female. It will require longer gestation to, for the brain development, for the larger intelligence. And with the greater intellectual development, you get a larger head, requiring the longer gestation. And with the larger head, you're going to get a larger birth canal needed. And with that, what, and that produced in the females, of the species of the Homo sapiens, their hips started to flare out to give room, to provide room for the larger birth canal. And with the larger, uh, with the hips starting to flare out, they can't run as fast as men. Then they can't keep up with the troop, and then that caused the genetic, and uh, uh, a change in the genetic code to develop, 
the need for the troop to develop a stationary headquarters. So now the stationary headquarters is needed for the females to take care of the young in the longer gestation period and for their own particular recovery and for the development of the young which is required a greater which is, which requires a greater length of time other animals don't have this problem as we see uh, hanging around barnyards uh, a calf or a colt a foal being dropped there immediately they can get up and they can walk within moments obviously a tremendous advantage uh, but the human species with its greater intellectual development that is no longer possible. So what happens? The stationary headquarters evolves. Males go out hunting. Females stay behind. But there's a further problem. Some males go hunting, but some males have to stay behind to protect the family, to protect the troops, to protect the, rear, uh, the, the rearing of the young, which have to be behind at the headquarters. But that causes an, an, an unease. Obviously, there's going to be an anxiety, a friction. The males away from the females are not going to be able to have a chance to pass their genetic code on to the, to the next generation. So they don't want to trust the, the other males and females together without them. So what happens? Evolution had a solution. Pair bonding. This allows the males to leave and be able to trust the females left behind in the, uh, at, the, at the headquarters of their, uh, wherever they are. So what happens? You get a pair bonding. And two types of pair bonding are created from, by evolution. One, the male-female for reproductive purposes. Another, male-male. The males have to be cooperative out in the field when they're hunting to be able to produce, to be able to uh, get their food, bring it back to HQ for the entire troop. So you have male-male for cooperative and, uh, pr uh, reasons for their production. And you have ma male-female for reproductive services to the society of the troop. And this bond is now called marriage. OK. So then we have the nature of marriage. So let's follow it along here. We've got biology. Biology needs reproduction for our society and, of course, this method, evolution, allowed us to uh, get past some of the, some of the problems of, of the evolutionary history of the Homo sapiens uh, to produce societies. And then we produced governments and laws. And within those laws, there are laws for marriage. Well, why did marriage occur? One, because there's a biological evolutionary need for it to have happened. And second, it's good for society reproductive purposes, which of course is commensurate with the purposes of biology. So within the laws for marriage, political and economic advantages appear to promote marriage, to promote the reproduction of the young. Political advantages and economic advantages are such things as insurance, insurance prices there are lots of business advantages, such as insurance, which prices uh, lower prices for married couples because they found that there's less, there's less uh, accidents happen with married couples because they're a little bit safer. They're not as aggressive. They're, uh, they're not, uh, the males are a little bit, um, uh, and uh, uh, males live longer, and they're a little bit less uh, anxious. So insurance has found that this is better uh, in their claims, insurance. And uh, so there are some advantages in combining expenses, not only with 
uh, of, of being able to live together. There are also other advantages such as inheritance tax, charitable deductions. Taxes can be uh, uh, individual taxes. Can use their, uh, their spouse can use uh, their uh, taxation uh, as, a sh as their spouse as a tax shelter. There are some IRA advantages. And all these advantages are to help the marriage of a male-female couple. Now, with that said, there's a quid pro quo going on here. Societal reproductive advantages on one side of the equation produce a political and economic advantages produced by society on the other side of the equation. In other words, society is giving some political and economic advantages to uh, the male-female bond relationship in order for them to reproduce, which allows society to proliferate. And so there's a quid pro quo. Now, should the society allow just the male-female reproductive advantage that we get? Should we allow the, should we give the political advantages to something else besides the male-female? Well, if you do, we don't get the quid pro quo. Obviously, a male versus, and male uh, or female and female marriage combination, uh, society doesn't benefit in any manner that it, got, that it does for a male-female relationship. So, is that right? So let's go to, uh, let's, let's ask Rick and find out what his opinion is whether same-sex marriage should be allowed or not. Rick, any thoughts? Well, uh, there's obviously, um, particularly in certain states, um, a welling up. I, I live in Washington, which uh, certainly allows same-sex marriage. And that law just changed recently. Um, there's a welling up of support for this. Um, and it seems likely that uh, several more states will vote on it. And I think if there is a majority that support it in a particular state, it's going to be difficult uh, to turn back that tide. Now that said, uh, there can't be, in my mind, uh, any justification for a federal law that ensures um, same-sex marriage would survive throughout any state in the Union. Uh, I think it's going to end up being a state-specific matter, but leaving those practical considerations for a moment, uh, the discomfort I have with the whole notion, and I know a number of gay couples, um, Connecticut, for example, has a gay marriage law, um, is that uh, the direction we're moving in is in the, in the realm of yet more social engineering. It seems to me that the the end game here is to somehow multiply the number of same-sex couples, um, get them to adopt as many children as possible, uh, and therefore somehow uh, in as many states as possible make this uh, as normal a situation in the minds of the public as they can. And that seems to be the strategy. Um, 
a second prong in this strategy, uh, I would say, is um, an effort to equate uh, gay marriage with <clears throat> other civil rights and to simply say that this is an extension of the civil rights accorded to uh, blacks and other minorities in the 60s, and therefore, why would anyone object to it? Uh, well, I, for one, uh, would uh, strongly object that this is in any way comparable to the civil rights, uh, which were reaffirmed and better protected by laws passed in the 60s. Um, and there are several reasons for that. One, um, there is no natural history of gay marriage uh, in Western civilization or, to my knowledge, in most other civilizations or major civilizations. It's a, the, the notion of uh, enshrining this in public law is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, so one has to get, ask the, the question, well, why? Why is this suddenly an issue, or relatively suddenly an issue, when it wasn't before? Um, so natural law does not favor the institution of gay marriage, unlike uh, slavery, where there have been societies that have, you know, forbid slavery for centuries, others tolerated it. So there was a case in natural law for removing slavery that grew over time. Uh, I can't equate uh, gay marriage to, to anything like that. Secondly, there's no mention in the Constitution or any of the amendments to the Constitution of that of gay marriage being enshrined as some sort of federal right. I mean, that's there's no constitutional basis for moving in this direction. And, and finally, one advantage of the federal system we enjoy is if a particular state, like Washington or Connecticut, uh, decides to go forward with this uh, social innovation, uh, we will, over the coming years, see how that turns out. How are these kids that are adopted by uh, gay couples, how are they going to turn out? So before any consideration at all is given to some sort of federal mandate, uh, we, we should, we're morally obligated to ensure that there's no damage done to people on the basis of social, social engineering that smacks of a lot of other attempted social engineering, whether it's the, you know, the, the, the commune uh, um, daycare centers of communist uh, Eastern Europe, which, which failed miserably, uh, or many of the other federal programs that have failed miserably uh, and have tried to change criminal behavior or something else over, over low, many, low these many years. So, in summary, um, I think there's no obvious moral case for a federal uh, law to be changed. And two, uh, we shall soon see in the coming years what happens with the state experiment. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting that you bring up the equivalency of marriage, um, heterosexual marriage, with uh, and the homosexual marriage as a civil rights uh, problem. Uh, and if it were to be a civil rights problem, then uh, you could actually then invoke uh, some probably the discussion of other problems uh, emanating from a, a civil rights basket of problems, such as polygamy, maybe a father would marry a son to g uh, gain the advantage of an inheritance tax, um, uh, passing on a, a, a wealth to his son. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, reproductive uh, uh, capacity here, so it's not really incest, but it'd be purely taking advantage of a civil right given to anybody now allowed to go into a marriage 
but it would take advantage almost of really a providing a tax shelter uh, in certain cases and taking advantage of the uh, of the various the marriage advantages. This would uh, this would certainly open up a uh, a can of worms. So well, I, I absolutely agree. I, I mean, you, you could, a man can marry a cow, right? I mean, you, you know, the imagination boggles as to what right one might, quote unquote, right one might want to propose uh, for either you know some financial reason or you know just to make a point. Right, uh, and your point that historically there was no precedent for uh, the same-sex marriage to evolve. And probably the reason for the same-sex marriage never to have evolved is that there's no benefit directly to society that we can see. And thus the issue then becomes a civil right in order to bring it into the spotlight of discussion. And if you bring it, attach a civil right to it, then many consequences can possibly occur. I guess there's a law saying the law of unintended consequences will open up uh, a tremendous, uh, well, shall I say, uh, uh, the um, loophole, just as some people try to use tax as a uh, uh, loopholes in tax in the tax code, then this civil right would be used as a loophole to gain certain advantages either economically or politically. Uh, did I uh, did I summarize that correctly from uh, from your discussion? Well, yes. I, I would say there's one uh, tangential, maybe not even tangential issue one needs to be mindful of, and that is, of course, judicial overreach. It's very difficult to be comfortable uh, with any type of social law once, you know, the courts get hold of it, uh, because they have, in the past, done a lot of silly things um, that have been, in the end, destructive. And so, I guess, in, in terms of opposition, any court-determined solution is something to be resisted, whereas if a particular state, a majority of the voters in a particular state vote on the issue, that has, in my mind, far more legitimacy. When you say court resisted, you mean the federal court? Uh, state or federal. Because uh, I think we're entering uh, a period when you're going to see at most often at the state level, I mean, obviously the federal court is going to rule on this whole thing soon, but I suspect that's going to be a very limited ruling, and it will enable states to continue to go ahead and experiment with this issue, and it will be, it will go through each state, or many of the states will go through iterations of a, legis a, a vote Either, either a popular vote or a legislative vote, uh, which then may be challenged in the local state court and then revisited. Uh, and in those cases, and we've seen many, uh, where the state um, judicial systems start to get involved, uh, you often see some pretty silly decisions made. I mean, I, there isn't time here to cite all the examples, but. There's certainly plenty in, in Washington. Uh, I'll give you one example uh, that happened lately, and that is the state court overturned the law, a popular referendum, which re previously required a two-thirds majority of the voters to uh, increase taxes on the grounds that it was somehow not benefiting uh, education enough, which is a quote-unquote a right, a right 
enshrined, enshrined in the local state constitution. Well, to me, that is, a, you know, a clear case of judicial overreach uh, because they are acting in defiance of the will of a, a voting group. Was that California? No, this was Washington. Okay. Right. So the uh, the issue seems to be have evolved really from into the civil rights arena. But it really is more appropriate at the state level, certainly, and certainly not appropriate at a federal level. Would you agree with that? I mean, absolutely. That it, you're, but you're, you're, if I, this, I don't believe this will happen, certainly not with the current Supreme Court, but if, uh, you know, a liberal Supreme Court of the sort we had, you know, maybe 20 years ago, had decided to go ahead and um, pass a law or allow a law to stand that that called for gay marriage or equated gay marriage to a basic civil right and defensible under the Constitution, I think you'd have, it's certainly in certain states, um, all kinds of legislative uh, and legal activity to try to to turn that, to, to restrict it, or uh, you'd have demonstrations uh, by Christian groups and others, uh, it would cause uh, more problems than it would be worth. Okay. I'd like to thank Rick Samuelson for joining us. And that's about all the time we have for this episode of The Philosophical Angle. Thank you for joining us. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you.